Hello and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And today we ask the question, do you really have competition? So we talked recently about an article, was it an article? Uh, oh no, it was, I don't remember what it was, David C. Baker's, I can't remember if it was his new book or an article, but one of the things that, oh, it was an older blog post. He he put in some numbers, he put some numbers around the size of a, a good size for a market and a good size for the pool of competitors it might have in that market. And I think that kind of got both of us thinking about, you know, is competition a good thing or a bad thing? How much competition is a good thing? You know, zero to mm -hmm. a million. And, and the more I thought about it leading up to this, the more I was wondering how to define it in the first place. Like, how do you define ah. who a competitor even is? So I think you use the term brand neighborhood. Is that? Yeah. Well, I don't use it just as, as a euphemism for competitors. It's also like the people that are outside your space who you'd like to live next door to. Like if you love the Apple design and the Apple ethos, Apple could be in your brand oh, neighborhood, okay. even though you're a soloist. But yeah, it is a way to kind of dig into what we conventionally think of as competition. So how do you define it? How would you say, like, who who would you say, or if you were working with a student, a coaching student, and you were like, you should have between 20 and 200 competitors. And that person said to you, <laughs> well, I don't have any, or I have a million, or well, how would I know who's a competitor? How would I even find that out? How would you advise them to go about calculating that number in the first place? Well, you know, what's interesting is usually when you ask somebody, at least for me, when I ask a, like a potential client, you know, who are your competitors, they're usually pretty quick to give me a list. And the list isn't always what I would define as their competition because they're different enough, but they're alternative choices in the similar space. In space defined by... Well, in, in our area, it would be, well, that's really the question, because if you think of the, of the Baker article, um, I think he would define the space pretty broadly. Like if you're a designer, you're, the space is all designers. So it's not, uh, if you're a consultant, your competition is all consultants. But if you are a change management consultant and you serve a specific uh, vertical that or a specific subset of change management, then I guess your competition is other people that are in that narrower space. Yeah. So as you get more niched and more specific with your messaging, then you can get clearer on who your competition is and the number smaller, right? It keeps going down. Right. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? It's like, on the one hand, niching down the exercise of niching down is one of the benefits of it and also one of the benefits of not having an hourly rate is it makes it difficult or perhaps impossible for prospects to compare you apples to apples against anyone so in the like for example in a i would say in a certain space i would say uh if a self-employed software developer wanted to learn everything they needed to know about value pricing i don't think i have any competition none like it's so specific there's but there's tons of people who teach about value pricing you know there's a mm -hmm. long list i could rattle off 12 probably but none of them are in the software space mm -hmm. so do i have competition i know i do and here's <laughs> not not if you define your audience that way but that's not how you define your audience you've got a bigger definition right so there's another right there's a, a another lens you can look at it through so like you could say well you're either a price, pricing consultant or a business coach, and you could definitely Google for business coach for software developers, and you'd probably find a bunch. It's it's like if you put a label on yourself, then people can Google for it and find a list of alternatives. Well, the dogs are really talking today, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> um, th there's another lens you can look at this through, which is when someone is considering hiring me and sometimes they say I'm also considering these three other people mm -hmm. so I know that they that from the from the prospective clients point of view I have competition like I know I do right because they say that uh, from where I'm sitting if they are a good fit for you or Mike Zapersky or David A. Fields or David, you know, the list of people, if they're a good right. fit for them, then they're not my, they're not, I don't feel the, you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. But that also says something about your mindset because someone who isn't as confident is going to go, oh, darn, that guy beat me again. 
Mm. Like that's my competition. Like, oh yeah, I should win. When I'm up against this person, I should win. And oh. it's a it's a very you know you're getting it right. Yeah, who am I losing deals to? Yeah, that's yeah right. So yeah. that's really interesting. And a lot of times, uh, I mean, I have heard this maybe four or five times in the past ten years or nine years. It's like you know this person like oh I'm thinking about going with you. I ended up going with you know, but I'm also talking to X Y and Z mm -hmm. and. You know, they follow. They're politely follow up and say, "Oh, I ended up going with X, Y, and Z." I'm like, "Great." So I don't, I don't have that attitude of like, "Oh no, uh, I'm getting crushed by." Whoever. Right. <laughs> uh, but I also don't have all the information. Like, I haven't. I, I don't know how many people were considering me, but didn't talk to me and right and, and had the same list. You know, so there's. So if if I heard from four or five, maybe there's forty or fifty that that went in a different direction. Maybe. You know, I don't know, but I do like that. I hadn't thought of that in, in preparing for this episode. I hadn't thought of that, like uh, your competition in your mind could be who you're losing deals to. I, I see it as dodging bullets, though. Well, yeah, that's the thing, because there, there is a guy, and I, I, it, I won't say his name in public, but he's, he's somebody who's like an occasional competitor, I think, of both of ours. And it's just funny, because whenever somebody comes to me and says, oh, I'm talking to this other guy... They never pick me. And I laugh. And there's, and it's become, it hasn't happened very often, maybe a half a dozen times, but it's a profile. And mm -hmm. they're, they're not my ideal client. And right. I'm happy they go to the other guy because I think they're much more likely to get what they want because there's something about the other guy that they like better, that they're more drawn to. Like, yeah. good, good. <laughs> yeah, we dodged a bullet. Right? right. And, and you know, maybe I could have gotten them the same result or better, um, but maybe they would have driven me bat crazy um, <laughs> in the process or vice versa. Right? right. It could happen. It could go both ways, of course. Right. Oh, that's OK. So that when whenever this has come up in the past, I always say, well, I, I don't really feel like I have any competitors. And not, I never knew why, because I know I do lose deals to people. But my mindset is that I probably dodged a bullet. It's probably going to be a better fit anyway. So much personality, so much like personality match is such a big deal of the kind of stuff we do that it's, yeah, it's really important to have like a really aligned kind of, kind of relationship. Yeah. And we also refer people, right? Yes. And so mm -hmm. you refer people to, to those who you might, someone less enlightened might think of as the competition in a, in a win lose kind of a way mm -hmm. versus, oh, they're the best equipped to deal with this kind of a profile of a problem or background or, you know, whatever the scenario is. And, you know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, it, it's like, a, you know, kiss them goodbye in a nice way. I'm not talking about like, you know, don't let your the door hit you on the butt, but in a yeah. nice way, it's like, I want you to get the help that you need. And I don't think I'm the right solution. Have you thought about talking to so-and-so? Right. Yeah. And it, it's hard to get there when you're first starting out or you're just starting to like kind of build your confidence or your book of business isn't full. Yeah. It's a scarcity versus abundance mindset, finite game yeah. versus infinite game. It's like exactly. you're not fighting over a finite pool of people who need business coaching. You know, it's like, I mean, it's technically finite, but it is so vast that it might as well be infinite because there are just more people than anyone could ever service, like even as a group. Um, so, but the question is, do you, do you really have competition? Yeah, you probably do. I mean, yeah. you probably do something that is at some altitude, you know, from the outside viewer who doesn't know everything that you know about you from the outside viewer, they might have you labeled as a, a management consultant or a business coach or an executive, uh, trainer or whatever. And you're just sort of pigeonholed in their minds as that. And so they, and if at a, you know, the, the sort of speeding past the billboard kind of, uh, of awareness level, like, oh, maybe a business coach would be an interesting thing. B business coaches near me or business coaches for small business or business <laughs> coaches for software developers or freelancers or consultants. Yeah. And, and you just get into that. This is the, I, I guess it's a mindset thing again, but this is why I don't. I don't even want to play that game. I don't want to be in the search results for business consultant for software developers. I don't care about that because then you're in this beauty contest 
And it's like, well, tell me why I should pick you instead of them. It's like, you should definitely not uh, pick me if that's your attitude. Yeah. 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 That's not a profile of a client I want to spend time with. Right. But I think, I think there's another thing though going on is sort of at the subterranean level in the, in the U S at least, right. Is that there is this deeply ingrained thing in capitalism that you have to have competition. I mean, it's one of the first things that I learned in, in undergrad and then in B school, it's like you have competition and your job is to slay them. You know, it's very much of a, like, I'm not even David and Goliath, but it's a battle and it's an epic battle, like the hero's journey, you know, and I, I get it. I mean, I do. And, and especially in big consumer product companies, they're absolutely, you have competition, but I think we can choose to approach it differently that we don't have to think of it as a battle to the death, that there's room for, for more than one competitor or more than one player not competitor more than one player player. exactly yeah that's it's so especially whenever we talk about strategy or there's just so many metaphors that are like either sports or military which are both zero-sum finite Mm -hmm. playing fields and it drives me nuts that there aren't more even the i love the fishing analogy but the thing i hate about it is the fish are getting killed in that metaphor and you're you're not doing that to your clients so there's i have never found a really great metaphor for this um, but it, it, yeah, I mean, it makes sense now that we're sort of de- talking, talking it through, but it makes sense that this is really the, you know, if you have an ab- abundance mindset, you're playing an infinite game and you see your air quotes competitors as other players, you know, you're all like in the park playing Frisbee. No one's trying to win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everyone's just trying yeah. to make things better, you know? So if you are, if you're that mindset of, 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 focusing on your competitors more than your clients is to me a dead end especially for someone who's like like us not you know cpg yeah. procter and gamble that kind of thing where they 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 literally could saturate a global market and so in order to support their 150,000 employees they need to because they've put themselves in that position you know they need everybody out there to buy a thing of tide every two weeks or layoffs mm-hmm. are coming right so they've got right you know, but for us, it's not like that. No, it's that's the like wrong that. game. Yeah, it's the wrong game. Well, you know, the other thing that I think is interesting, though, about this idea of setting up, you know, competition is that you can use competition, um, provided it's serving your your ideal client. You can use them as as a different goalpost. Here we go with the sports analogies again. <laughs> but like when I was doing the the research for my soloist women program, one of the things a few people said was they were tired of like the gimmicks. And so what I wound up using in my marketing materials, I said that there will be, um, how did I say it? No matching necklaces and, you know, no cutesy group (laughs) nicknames and no million dollar retreats with chauffeur driven Bentleys, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, that would so not be my style, but I wanted to put a stake in the ground and say, this is going to be the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so you can use it in that way, but you don't see me splashing that all over everything. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't really care what they do. That's a different audience. Those are not my people, Mm -hmm. but you can use them as, as a goalpost. Yep. Especially when you're starting out, if you know that you're like someone well-known, but you're different in some particular way, highlighting that can be a really, really good shortcut to a narrow positioning Mm -hmm. statement or like a niche so like uber but for dogs you know is the classic Mm -hmm. example (laughs) on the on you you absolutely can but i think you you're just you're saying the same thing i'm just repeating it which is that focusing on beating your competition is in my opinion just backwards it should you should be focusing on serving your ideal buyers better and better and better and if you stay focused on that your competition won't won't they'll just fade into the the distance, you'll stop seeing them as competition. Yeah. Or you might even wind up having a relationship with them because you realize how different you really are in, in some fundamental ways or just some key ways in the marketplace. And you actually align with them, i.e. you come on their podcast. Right. Right. And before you would have gone, no, that's the enemy. That's the devil. No, I'm not going to go on that. But then when you start to see it differently, and you, and if you want to make the first move, you invite them on yours. Right. So this is where, for me, this is where having a mission comes in 
super becomes super important because whenever whenever I have a uh, a moment where I'm like, should I do this or should I do that? Should I make this product? How should I design this product? Should I invite this person on my show? It it can be like, oh, there's lots of pros and cons. But then if I remember to say to myself, will this be better for the mission? The answer is always instantaneously clear. Mm-hmm. It's instantly yeah. clear. Yeah. Should I have Blair ons on it? Blair ends on my podcast or not? It's like, well, he does training. It's like same kind of st- it like so. And then it's like, what is it good for the mission? Yeah, it's great for the mission. All right, do it. <laughs> So if you if you think about, I mean, I, I know we've talked about mission a lot in the past and not everybody needs to have one day one or it's just super helpful if you have one because it helps you make decisions like that. Helps you run your life. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Sense of fulfillment. That's stay yeah. on target. Focus over the, over a course of years or decades. It's very helpful. Uh, but speaking of speaking of some of these other names were, were popping up. Another thing occurred to me thinking about this was the difference between competitors and alternatives so and you can you can take this really really broad you can go super broad with Mm -hmm. this but so let's just kind of define the playing field uh if you have uh someone who basically needs what you do like they they recognize that they need um oh i I didn't want to keep using myself as an example but but they need they need like um clarity around their positioning let's just use that in a situation where they're serving too many customers uh, they've got really bad customer churn they can't please everybody so they're not pleasing anybody really and they're they've got really bad customer churn and and they hear about you and you do something to solve that problem you do you decrease your your headline is uh customer churn got you up nights you spent all that money to acquire those customers and they're leaving after three months before you even recoup your customer acquisition costs and it's like the right person to be like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and then you introduce the offer, whatever that might be. So you're like, okay, I've got a solution for this. And they look at it and they consider the offer. And maybe it's some kind of uh, road mapping engagement. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's and it's five figures, right? So they're like, then so they talk to you and they're like, ooh, it's five figures. Um, now all of a sudden in their head, they've got a roughly a five figure budget. Anything less than your roadmap costs is the budget they have to look for alternatives to that solution. So all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, we're not so sure we need a roadmap. That might not be the most cost effective solution to this problem, or it might we don't have the cash flow to drop fifty grand on on a roadmap. But here's what we could do. We could spend maybe 30 grand on uh, training for our customer support or something about the product. We could take 25 grand and plowed into the product. You know, so it's, these are not competitors, but they are things that you could lose the deal to. And it's, and there's an even bigger version of this, which I'll just say for logical completeness, but I don't think it's necessarily something we can worry about, but maybe it is that, yeah, actually it is. So the bigger thing is even, that the churn is only one big problem that they have. And they're like, well, if we're going to spend 50 grand trying to address churn, what's the opportunity cost? Like what it's going to take time and money. Where else could we put that time and money? Like maybe leadership training, maybe a retreat, maybe something completely different that solves a different problem. So the, the, the cost of doing other, you know, like that might not be the most expensive problem on the table. So they could, they're not picking a competitor and they're not picking an alternative. In this case, they're solving a completely different problem because they've got more than one. Well, the other thing is sometimes the presenting, not sometimes, a lot of times, the presenting problem is not really the problem. It's actually just a sign of mm-hmm. what's happening. So you've, you've got that kind of conversation. Yeah, it, it made me think when you were saying that of like when you, you decide to like redo your bathroom and then, you know, there's the door from the bathroom to the rest of the house. You know, well, we should really change that door, that interior door. And then you do that and you're like, oh, now all the other doors look really crappy. So we, maybe we should do that. <laughs> and then, oh, yeah, but the hallway that the bathroom is off to that floor is looking really bad now that it's got this all these swanky new doors. I think maybe we need to address that. You know, it's kind of like, it's a little bit like that. Um yeah. I feel seen. This is why our bathroom hasn't been redone in the 16 years that we've been in this house is it always <laughs> turns into that conversation. I, you, it's, it's, it's where do you stop? Yeah. We have to knock the house down to redo the bathroom. 
Yeah. And a lot of times what happens is the client doesn't want to go that far, but the consultant does, right? Because the consultant comes in and sees that the customer churn is just is just the um, the manifestation of something much deeper, which is that, I don't know, um, uh, the tech people and the sales people can't agree on what the product actually is, yes, and they yes. can't agree on how it should be positioned and what customer base is their ideal. And, you know, when you start getting your nose into that, you know, that's not a $50,000 assignment anymore. That's going to be probably six figures. Right. So, yeah, yeah. So that, it brings up, Another uh, another relevant point that reminds me of the apples to oranges thing. So because I think I think you you tell me, but I'm pretty sure I can't think of a reason why you'd ever want to be compared apples to apples with anybody. You always want to be the feels, orange in the bushel. Yeah, it feels bad. Like you know, I'm not cute enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the beauty contest, right? It's like right. no, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to be apples to apples because nobody else is exactly like me. Right. So let's say you've got two people. We'll stick with uh, business coach types, uh, even business coach for, for SMBs, let's say. It's terribly broad, but let's just say. And and they both have roughly the same expertise. They read all the same books. Um, there are differences of personality and so forth. But one of them offers like a four-month coaching program and the other one offers their packages their expertise as a series of video courses right so maybe maybe they both do offer some coaching services but if you come to the market and the problem is let's go back to the the churn the the symptom the presenting problem is customer churn and and you get these two different people that potentially offer a solution to it the packaging of the solution could be novel and could be it could be better or worse aligned with what the client thinks either they want to spend in time, spend in money, or it matches their expectations of their preconceived notions, their preconceived notions of what the solution should look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? So if you, if, if the yeah. buyer is like, I've got this problem and they probably subconsciously know that if they found a credible solution, it would be worth X dollars, like in all day long. Like if I could find a credible solution to this that that costs ten thousand dollars, I'd write that check in a heartbeat, right? So, mm -hmm. so one person is like, oh well, it's a it's an intensive six week uh, interview laden process where I interview your executive management team and then you give me a half a dozen customers to interview. I interview them. Then I go out and do market research against your competitors. It's a drawn out, drawn out, drawn out process. So it's going to take a lot of time, calendar time. It's going to take a lot of the client's time. It's going to take a lot of the consultant's time. So maybe a $50,000 price tag doesn't seem unreasonable for that, but they were only in the market to spend. This is a $20,000 problem. This is not a $50,000 problem. So tell you what, why don't, you know, the consultant B or coach B is like, well, I'll just teach you how to do all the stuff you need to do with this, you know, half day workshop and a series of videos. And uh, if you have any follow up questions, you can uh, unlimited email support. And that's $20,000. So it's not just it's not just the price. The price is a big factor here, but it's also the investment of the I think the it probably actually take them longer this way, but it might not feel like it. It might feel like, oh, all I have to do is watch these videos. And if I have any questions, I'll email the guy. And, you know, anyone experienced is going to know that will probably take them 18 months if it works at all. And then they'll end up going hiring the first guy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a perceived not perceived. There's a, a control difference. So in the second scenario, the client feels like they've got some control. Great point. Least, yes. Great yeah. point. And sometimes that's that's enough. That's enough to make that difference because I could argue from the consultant side, those two approaches are probably similar in the sense of the, the bottom line that it delivers to, to their business. Mm -hmm. You know, 50,000 heavily, you know, soloist intensive and 20,000 where you can leverage your time a little bit more. So, I mean, I could, I could totally see that situation. And th there are clients who it's all about the control. And or about the speed of getting to something and then they don't mind spending a lot of money or other clients where they're really budget conscious and they'll take longer to get there if it means that they are going to get there. Right. Yeah. They'll. It's OK because the, the longer like they don't want a six month intensive that's 50 grand up front 
because that for cash flow reasons, let's say, uh, that maybe they want to feel they want to feel uh, they want to do a little more DIY for control reasons, and then they can spread it out to match what their the cash flow allows or their whatever whatever their other resources constraints allow, and do it at their own pace without you know having this other person like breathing down their neck all the time like oh you didn't get back to me about the the focus group meetings. Um, okay, so I guess. I guess the idea that I, I want to surface is that if you feel like you have competitors and you're you're losing business to them, so you're really feeling like you're really feeling like oh, I'm just losing. If like if anybody, if any prospect hears about this other person, this competitor of mine, they always go with them, and and Ugh, that would yeah. be demoralizing. Yeah, it's terrible, right? So it's like okay, innovate. What are the different things you could do? You could niche down to a place that's that's more specific than the other person, or the, the to wrap up the topic, uh, the current topic, you could package your expertise in a way that nobody else is doing, mm-hmm. like in a novel, innovative way that perhaps collapses your costs, which allows you to offer a very effective solution for a tenth of the price, let's say, uh, or uh, or gives the client more control over the pacing of the execution or whatever, but it, it takes away that apples to apples comparison when, you know, they come along and they say, well, oh, geez, the, you know, this person is very expensive, but it's one-on-one concierge type of an experience, which may or may not be attractive to a particular buyer. So if you can, you could say something like, oh, I'm just like expensive competitor, except you take control over the process. You can spend the money however and whenever you want. You could mm-hmm. spread it out. You could do it. You know, it's not, there's not this high pressure get this done in six months type of thing. Well, you know who came to mind when you said that was was our pal Pia Silva. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, because she, I mean, she totally packaged her, her design slash strategy services in a way that is unusual and it's arresting, mm-hmm. right? You see it and you notice it and you probably either go, wow, I love this. This is really cool or eh, that's not for me. Right. But yeah, but she's created a very successful business model doing exactly that. Right. Yeah, brand shrink, I think it's called. Brand shrink, that's right. Um do we need to talk about if we're we're on the subject, the other thing that comes up is status quo is your competition. So I, I don't know if I feel like that's stretching the focus here, but someone is basically you know, we're we're gonna do something or not, <laughs> right? They're like, We yeah. Well, but what's interesting about that, though, is that sometimes what that's telling you is that your offering isn't compelling enough. It's too much like the status quo that it's not worth the money mm-hmm. to the client. So, you know, when you think about making great change, you know, it's it's kind of obvious, right? We're going to make this great change. Here's the outcome. That's worth a lot of money. We're going to make this incremental change. Eh, you know, I'd rather not do that. You know, I just, it's, you know, it's, do you want to take a walk around the block or do you want to walk to, you know, California, Hmm. assuming you're not starting in California? (laughs) Um, Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's how people think about it. Hmm. Wild. Okay. So one other topic that keeps floating up in my mind is the, the, the notion of demand. So it would be pretty easy to come up with something where you have no competitors, but it's because there's no demand. Like, oh, uh, we're like McDonald's, but we sell rat burgers. And it's like, <laughs> you know, know, right. No, it's a, you, you, no competitors, no competition. We're the only rat burger game in town, but nobody wants that. Right. So, so nobody I know. Yeah. So if you, I guess I'm, I guess I'm bringing this up as a warning, uh, Sometimes you hear people say like, well, if you have no competition, that's probably a sign that there's no demand for this. Like if there's nobody Mm -hmm. out there kind of like trying to climb this particular mountain, it might be that it's just not worth the, the, so, or or it's at least it's packaged in a way you're presenting it in a way in a package or with a label on it that is, is not attractive. So people don't recognize that maybe like, maybe, you know, that you can help people a uh, particular kind of client or you know you can help them because I don't know because uh, you're a data scientist and everybody's got it got all of their all these small businesses have their data trapped in Excel and 
there's it's just a mess it's completely siloed it's getting overwritten it's all wrong it's not getting used uh, properly and you're like i know i can make that situation better but you you just you're putting it in a way that it's like hey need any data science hey do you have excel i have data science <laughs> two great tastes that taste great together and overkill yeah people are just like and it's expensive and people are like uh no no like mm -hmm. data science for people who use excel it's like i that's doesn't sound like a, a label that anyone's looking for a prescription anyone's looking for so if you don't have i think if you if you it could be that you're selling rat burgers and there's no way to package it in an attractive uh way or you're selling something that that probably would deliver business value and you, maybe you've even done it before as an employee so you know it does but it's just not being presented to the market in a way that that anyone recognizes it so i think you want to be i mean this might get into your revolution concept you want to be in the ballpark but different you know you don't want you you want to be in you want to be the orange in the barrel of apples you don't want to be an orange like off in the forest <laughs> no one is you know what i mean i don't know if I'm, I'm stretching the metaphor a little bit it's clearer in my mind than it is coming out of my mouth but you want to be different to the club you, you want to be different you want to be different but in a way that still addresses a demand well yeah a different in a way that's productive right it's not just about the packaging although packaging matters it's about it's about the essence and where i thought you were going with the revolution is that when I think of the rev of the revolution that you want to lead, it's about an important to you and to your audience change, something that you want to be different in the world. So if you're picking something that's too small, that's too restricted, that's too um, special, you know, kind of like um, it, the, the image I have is of someone who isn't really connected in the world. They have an an interior view of a problem, but they haven't yeah. gotten any input about that problem, about the level at which it's shared. And that's really easy to do when you've been, let's say you've been doing a, a some kind of a technical role in an organization, any kind of technical, I'm not talking about like tech tech. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you just assume that your experience is the same everywhere else. And you don't talk to other people, you don't find out what's different. That's the kind of person that's going to have trouble selling even freelance work because they're not going to understand how the work that they do connects to the bigger picture. Right. So I feel like I, I'm sort of, I think I kind of dragged the, I drug the conversation into sort of a more of a positioning area, which is related. Well, no, what I was going to say is that positioning is how you're creating your competitors, right? Oh, that's a funny way to put it. You're picking yeah. your competitors, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. like I could, I could all of a sudden start saying I work with software developers and yada yada yada, and and right. I could be like a direct competitor with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, <laughs> people wouldn't believe me that I understood everything about software development. That wouldn't happen. Um, right. But yeah, I think we do create our our own competitors. That's wild. Yeah, I mean that is part of picking the market. You know, if we if you imagine the farmers mm -hmm. market, well, your comp your competition is right there, tangibly, physically in the meat space. Like you're selling tomatoes, the next stand down is selling tomatoes. Like you're in competition, <laughs> right? <laughs> like if you want to sell tomatoes, so it is that's true. I mean, you're picking the group of sellers that you want to be th that you're at least adjacent to, if not in direct competition with. So like you know, if there's if you're selling fresh bread and everybody else is selling produce that's 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 where i would want to be like if if the farmer's market was all vegetables i would be like hmm, what am i going to sell here i don't want to sell vegetables and just be literally apples to apples comparison with the people next to me i'm going to sell coffee something that smells good <laughs> right yeah that's a good idea. yeah or pies i'm thinking of our farmer's market we have somebody yeah. who sells pies somebody who sells bread somebody who sells uh jam which is close to to fruits and vegetables because it's made from those but right yeah. yeah, exactly. I'd rather I'd rather be that person than uh, than the the like you. Well, I mean, it gets it's obviously you, you need to be different in some meaningful way. And I guess thinking back on the conversation, we've identified a bunch of different ways that you could be different. Either explicitly contrast yourself with a with a well known air quotes competitor, package your services in a way that is is novel, like none of your other competitors are packaging their services that way. 
or niche down so far that yes, you're still a insert thing that you do, but you do it for such a specific audience that no one can compete with you because they don't, they just don't connect with that audience as well as you do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a bunch of clients in that, in that category and nobody gets there overnight. You just keep kind of worming your way in. Yeah. And sometimes you can use your competition to help clarify this for you. Cause you'll look at somebody and you go, ugh. I don't want to be like them. I, I can't believe they're a leading voice in the field. I totally disagree with them. And my style is, is the diametric opposite, right? Yeah. So, so you look at them and you say, all right, I'm going to be the anti that person, even though you don't put that in your marketing material, but that's how you start to behave. And, and you think about if your competition is a group of, let's say five or six um, other um, soloists or small firms, then you say, all right, well, what's different about me versus them? Now, again, that's not the first prism. The first prism is your ideal audience. The competition yeah. is not the game. They're just off there. So once you've done that, then you say, okay, for my ideal audience, you know, why would they go to that person? What, and what are the differences between us? And when you start to think about it that way, don't act on it right away, but just pay attention. I think it can be really instructive on how to differentiate yourself from some of those other folks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the fourth variable in my laser focus look, that's easy for me to say, <laughs> uh, laser focus positioning statement is your unique difference. And whenever I have someone struggling with it, I say, okay, in order to know how you're different from your competitors, you need to know who your competitors are. Who are they? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, that's why you can't figure it out. So find out who they are. And then it'll probably like, just like you just described, it'll jump off the page at them. Like, oh, I'm not, not necklaces. No, I would never do that or whatever, whatever the difference mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Cool. All right. I feel like that. I feel like we've yeah. beaten that one into submission. What do you think? Create your own competitors. Love it. <laughs> yeah. I never <laughs> thought of it like that. It's true. All right, folks. That's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. And we hope you join us again next time on the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye-bye.